Oh, hello. You startled me. Let me ask you a question. What is so special about this roofing material here? Do you know? Well, let me tell you. It is made of a little thing called teeny tiny atoms. They make up the whole world around us. They are quite amazing. But who first discovered the atom? Many times I ponder this question myself. Well, we shall learn it. Do da 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 do da 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 consisted of a nuclear atom which consisted of a nucleus with a positive charge. A majestic man, Ernest Rutherford, performed an experiment in which he shot alpha particles precisely in a straight line to a thin sheet of gold foil. Surrounding the foil was a screen that detected the impact of these alpha particles. Something bizarre happened. While most of the particles traveled right through the foil, a handful bounced back. Based on his observations, Rutherford devised the Rutherford model of the atom. The particles that came close and rebounded off of the foil were those that had a close encounter with the positive nucleus. Rutherford concluded that the atom was mostly empty space, except for the dense positive nucleus surrounded by the negatively charged electrons. The nucleus was comprised of protons, and later Rutherford discovered that neutral particles existed from within the atom. He accordingly called them neutrons. Rutherford still had some unanswered questions, and it was obvious that more testing needed to be done. Now, let's see if we can visualize how light transmits energy in order to understand this concept. We visualize light in two different ways. First, we visualize light as a wave of energy, but also as a stream of energy packets called photons. Ooh, quite bitter. So we're going to go ahead and wear some safety goggles just to be sure. Now, atoms by nature are at their ground state. Now, atoms can be excited into a higher energy level by adding energy such as heat. Now, once they're at their excited energy level, they have a tendency to want to drop back to their ground state. And so to do so, they end up rele releasing a photon of a different color. If we take a look at that color, we're able to de determine just how high that atom had to jump to the high energy level and how high it jumped back down to its ground state. Now, when an atom drops from its excited state down to its ground state, it, a light color is emitted. Now, the light color of that photon really tells us just how high that energy level drop was. If it's a color such as red, like this beautiful strawberry here, then we know that the energy level drop is relatively low. However, if it's a color such as this blue wash rag here, we, uh, blue, you know, we know that it's a drop of relatively high energy. There it goes! Oh, he must be here to talk about Bohr. Well, let's begin with his model. Bohr created a model based on a positive, dense nucleus with orbiting electrons, just as planets orbit the sun in the solar system. Now, Bohr decided that he would, through experimentation, prove that, in his case, hydrogen, had fixed energy levels. But how do we create electron configurations? Elements are grouped by the atomic number which tells us the number of electrons. Electron configurations are written in order following this table from the bottom up. Oh. <laughs> now we're going to be using some Sharpie for the next scene here, so keep in mind it is permanent. 
The number in this place represents the principal energy level. In this case, it's 1. Over here, this letter represents the shape of the orbitals. And over here, this little number right there, that represents the number of electrons in this orbital at one given time. Now let's take a closer look at one of these element squares, beryllium. Now beryllium has an atomic number of four. The elements on the periodic table of elements are sorted by the atomic number. So not only does this number tell us how to sort beryllium, but the number also represents the number of protons. Now keep in mind, protons have a positive charge in them, which means the same number of protons is also equal to the same number of electrons. Now let's start with the first element, hydrogen. Now hydrogen has an atomic number of one, and its electron configuration is gonna be one, S, one. This one is lithium, Li. Its atomic number is number three, if you haven't guessed that yet, and its electron configuration is gonna be one, S, two, because you can have two electrons, and the second orbital is gonna be two, S, one. Now let's go ahead and jump ahead to a couple of other elements as well. Uh, let, let, let's start with neon. Neon is Ne. Now neon has 10, an atomic number of 10, which means it has 10 electrons in it. So we can write that out by using multiple orbitals represented. Now keep in mind that the amount of electrons in each orbital, 6, 2, and 2, all add up to 10 electrons total. Now this can get pretty burdenous and uh, hefty to write down, so we go ahead and shorthand this if you want to NE in a pair of brackets. Now what we could do with these brackets is we can use them to shorthand almost any element after that, such as, uh, such as magnesium here. Once we got magnesium down, which has 12 electrons in it, atomic number of 12, we can use neon, which we know already has 10 electrons in it. So neon, 10 electrons. And then we know we need two more electrons after that, so we follow it simply with a 3s orbital because it's following the 2, and we have it a 3s orbital of two electrons in it, adding to 12. Now elements after number 18, such as potassium, number 19, follow a different set of rules. So potassium has the atomic number of 19. Now, in order to do this, we take argon, which has a natural electron state of 18 electrons, and we add an additional one electron to that with a 4s1 orbital. Now with ions, all we have to do is take a look and see if any of the electrons were gained or lost by the atom, and then we have to subtract or add them accordingly. 